What's going on engineers? In this video we're going to be looking at MySQL triggers, specifically what are they, when you should use them, and then how to use them. Now while this video is specific to MySQL, the concepts are the same for the database platforms and also the syntax should be similar as well. So first, what is a trigger? Conceptually, triggers are quite simple. They're nothing more than one or more SQL statements that run in a response to an event. And those events in MySQL are before update, before insert, before delete, and then after update, after insert, and after delete. So basically you could set up a trigger that says, when a row is inserted into this table, run this set of SQL statements, which can do any number of things. And because any valid SQL statement or statements is a valid trigger body, that means that you have immense flexibility in what you can do in response to these particular events. On the topic of when you should use triggers, that's up to a little bit of debate. Depending on who you ask, you'll get responses ranging anywhere from triggers are evil and you should never use them, all the way up until triggers are amazing and you should use them as much as possible. My position on the matter is that they should not be overused, but if they are used judiciously and for a specific use case, then they can add a lot of value. So let's jump in and look at an example about a problem that we can solve with triggers and then actually implement those triggers to solve that problem. For example, we're gonna have two tables here. One is gonna be posts and one's gonna be likes. And you can think of this as tables for a really simple social application where a post is made and then people can like that post. We're expecting some really heavy traffic on this application and we expect that every post is going to be liked around 100 to 150,000 times. We would like to display on the post the number of likes that it has received. A simple but inefficient approach for knowing how many likes a post has is simply to query for the post and then count all of the records in the likes table for a given post ID. Note earlier that I said we're expecting between 100 and 150,000 likes per post, and to count that many records every time a post loads is going to take too long. This problem is amplified even further if you were to retrieve, say, 10 posts, each with 100 to 150,000 likes. In this case, you're counting upwards of 1 million rows. If only there were a better way. Triggers to the rescue. So have a look here in our post table. We have this field called likes. It's an unsigned integer and it defaults to zero when the row is inserted. So rather than counting all the records in the likes table, what if we create a trigger that ran after an insert or delete of a like and that updated the likes value in the post table with either a plus one or negative one. In this way, we can guarantee that the number of likes in the post table matches the count of all the records in the likes table for a given post ID. So now in our application, when we retrieve a bunch of posts, rather than counting all the likes in the likes table, we can just show the value of likes from the post table. We'll start by creating the insert trigger and then we'll create the delete trigger. So the syntax for creating a trigger starts with create trigger and then you specify a name. So because I'm doing the insert one, I'll name it something like likes insert. You should know that triggers are per database. So you'll want to pick a sufficiently unique trigger name. The next part of the trigger specifies when it should run and on what table. So in this case, we want to do after insert on likes. Likes is going to be the table that we're inserting on. Then finally, we'll specify that we want to run this trigger for each row. And then the last two things are a begin and an end. And then what you actually want to run goes between the begin and the end. So the query here is simple. We simply want to update the likes field in the post table to increment by one anytime an insert occurs. So we can do update post set likes equals likes plus one, where post ID equals, well, wait, what do we do? How do we know the post ID? And this is where we use a special variable that we get in triggers called old and new. And because we're doing an insert, all we have access to is the new. So what new will reference is the actual record that was just inserted into the likes table. So in this case, we can say new dot post ID, which will get the ID from the like that was just inserted. There's also an old variable, but you don't get access to it for inserts. For inserts, you only get access to the new. For deletes, you only get access to the old. And then for update triggers, you get access to the old and the new. Now our insert trigger is complete. The last thing we need is something called a delimiter. And the reason we need this is because if I were to copy this entire statement and try to run it, it would show up with an error. The problem is if I were to run this, it's only gonna take up to the semicolon and it's gonna interpret it as if I just highlighted this portion. So what we actually need is to set a different delimiter just for the trigger. So the delimiter I like to use is dollar dollar. And what this will mean is that this semicolon inside the body will actually be the end of this particular query. So then we can end this with dollar dollar and then set the delimiter back to semicolon. 
I know that was kind of confusing, but it's something that's required when we're using SQL statements inside a trigger. But just think of this as just for the purpose of inserting the trigger, I change the termination of a statement from semicolon to dollar dollar. And then right after I insert the trigger, of course, I set the delimiter back to a semicolon. So now all we have to do is copy all of this, go into our database, paste it, and it should say query OK, zero rows affected. If we want to see all the triggers currently in this database, we can issue a command called show triggers. And this will show us all the triggers. Of course, it's a little difficult to read, but if you look closely, you can see our statement as being right here. The last thing we have to do is, is create the delete trigger. So we can start by just copying and pasting the insert trigger. And all we're gonna change here is instead of after insert, we're gonna do after delete. And then instead of likes plus one, we'll do likes minus one. And then instead of new.postid, we're gonna do old.postid. And then of course we'll modify the unique name from a likes insert to something like likes delete. And let's add this trigger in as well. All good, query okay, zero rows affected. Now if you were to mess up your trigger and you needed to delete it and then redo it, the syntax for that is going to be drop trigger and then the name of the trigger. So likes insert, we can also drop likes delete. If we were to run both of those, it would delete both our triggers. So what we're looking to do now is actually test out our triggers. So what we wanna do is we wanna create a post and we wanna add several like records. So we can start by creating our post. So insert into post values, default title will be title one, content would be content one, and then likes of course is zero as the default. We can look at that record now, select from post. So post ID two, title one, content one, likes zero. So what we'll do now is we'll insert three likes. So insert into likes. The post ID is gonna be two, because that's the post we wanna add a like to. And then we'll do user ID one, user ID two, user ID three. So now when I retrieve all records from posts, select all from posts, you can see now it has the likes as three. This is nifty because it's handling this without any additional interaction other than the composition of the trigger itself. So I'm gonna issue a statement where I just delete all the likes in my database, delete from likes, and then that deletes seven rows. I will now select all from posts again, and you will see that it's now back to zero likes. We've now confirmed that our trigger is working perfectly. So some of you might be thinking at this point, well, I could just as easily implemented this in my application code. I don't need to do it in the database. And the answer is you absolutely could. However, that's subject to two drawbacks. The first drawback is that your application code could be subject to regressions and therefore this may stop working. And then now your likes is all out of sync. The second thing is that if you have two separate applications that are accessing the same database, then you would actually have to have that logic to manage the likes in both application one and application two. And that's really all there is to triggers. If used correctly, they can be of a big help, but if used improperly, they can definitely be a big pain. In the end, of course, it's completely up to you to determine if this is a good solution to your problem. If you have any questions or comments about anything you saw in this video, please feel free to leave a comment down below. And other than that, I hope to see you on the next video. Take care.